So far on Money Pit, we've been putting new feet, new legs, new biceps, new butt muscles on the Miata, and little dudes getting beefy. But just like a lanky teenager with more muscles than coordination, the Miata's brain is still just a little bit behind. So do we just sit here and wait for this thing to go through puberty to develop some cognitive skills? Or do we attempt brain surgery? I think we attempt brain surgery. I think I'd be good at it. So today, that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna rip out the stock ECU and replace it with an aftermarket standalone ECU. Just like brain surgery, this could go wrong and leave the Miata dead on the table. Or it could open us up to making big power. Along the way, we'll talk about what this allows us to take control of. We'll also talk about what the cons are. And then at the end of the episode, we're gonna take this thing back to the dyno and see if we can make any more power with just a new tune. I'm Zach and this is Money Pit. Let's do some brain surgery. Big thanks to Jazzwares and Micro Machines for sponsoring this week's episode of Money Pit. Millions of people love playing with cars, but they're just too darn big to have any fun with. If only they were less big and more micro. It's too big. Yo, my guy, James, try this out. Now you too can think big and play small with the rebirth of Micro Machines. Playing with cars has never been more fun or easier than playing with these miniature, micro, highly detailed toys. Let your imagination run wild with these realistic vehicles and play sets. Yes, you heard it right. Micro Machines are back, baby. And we couldn't be more excited that Jazzwares asked us to be a media partner for the relaunch. My plan has worked. I get paid to play with toys. Hey Job, you bet you're pretty jealous having to work on a real car when I get to play with these tiny ones. This one's pretty small too. Micro machines are perfect for all car enthusiasts and collectors out there. And for me, it's a really fun way to relive my childhood years with my family. I mean, I remember playing with Super Van City, a dope van with cars that transforms into a real city that you can play with. And guess what, man? Super Van City is back and it's better than ever. It's freaking crazy. I missed you! You're never too old to be a kid again. So click on the link in the description below. Check out all the sets and vehicles that Micro Machines is launching. Keep an eye out for them in retail stores. Thanks again to Jazzwares and Micro Machines for including us. We are so excited about Yay! this. Now, back to the Zach. See how many heat breaks this time. Hey man, hey man, these things are holding strong. I've had these out like at least five times and I think we've only had really one casualty. Oh, just kidding. Just kidding. There she is. All right, before we go any further, I'm gonna disconnect the battery because uh, you don't wanna mess with electrical components in general, especially important ones like the ECU uh, with the battery connected. So the ECU is where all the sensors from the engine bay go to, and it's definitely the brain of the car. And it's programmed by the engineers who made your car to run efficiently and safely in all conditions. And the other thing is once you start modifying a car, like we have, you start putting some aftermarket car parts on your engine, you've changed the engine. And if you don't change the tune, you're not fully utilizing the parts that you've installed on your car. So in the case of the Miata, the intake, the headers, the exhaust, all those things that we've installed, they're not being really taken into account on the factory tune. In my opinion, the best option on the Miata is a full standalone. If you watched the flamethrower video on the Miata, we flashed my roommate Cerrone's ECU and put a new file on it to account for the modifications that he had and the outcome that he wanted. It's not really that easy on this ECU, so that's why we're going full standalone. But on a lot of newer cars, you do have that option. You don't have to go full standalone. You get to retain your OEM ECU, but you get to take control of it, which is really cool because the biggest problem, in my opinion, with a standalone ECU is that it's not gonna pass smog anymore. And for that reason, I'm definitely not gonna throw this thing away in case we ever need to pass smog. Like next year? Like a couple months? Yeah, like right now. <laughs> but the fact is that the stock ECU is controlling a lot of stuff and the guys who wrote the stock tune are really smart. So putting all this responsibility into our hands is no small matter. Uh, we're gonna have to make sure that we do a lot of things right to make this thing run as good as possible. But I think we can do it. So if you're looking at any standalone ECU, it's gonna give you a lot of power. You're gonna be able to take control of a lot of things. For one, you're no longer tied to your stock fuel injectors. If you were to put new, larger injectors in, like in case you were trying to turbocharge a Miata, 
you would need to be able to tell the ECU about those bigger injectors, what size they are and how much fuel they're squirting. So the Mega Squirt gives us that ability. Another thing it gives us control over is our spark timing, which is super important for making good power and not hurting our engine. Very important to have control over that. The Miata currently uses a mass airflow sensor, but the Mega Squirt will allow us to move to a speed density setup. Being able to move to speed density lets us get rid of our mass airflow sensor, which is important if you're trying to go turbo. And then the ECU actually has a map sensor built in or manifold absolute pressure. And it's responsible for taking the pressure in the manifold at all times. It's gonna use our stock math for now, so that's where it gets the temp signal from, RPM signal, and we will tell it what size the engine is. And with those things, the ECU can figure out how much air is flowing through the engine at any point, and then from that, figure out how much fuel to squirt into each cylinder based on the target air fuel ratios that you set. All we have to do is tune our volumetric efficiency. That's what speed density is. Let's talk about that for a minute. Oh my God, it's hot out here. Okay, so let's talk about volumetric efficiency and what it is. It's basically the percentage of the theoretical displacement of an engine that is actually being displaced at any given time. This is a 1.8 liter engine. So if its volumetric efficiency was at 100%, that means it's actually displacing 1.8 liters of air on every revolution of the crankshaft. No engine runs at full volumetric efficiency all the time. But when this thing is at max power at wide open throttle, hopefully we're getting close to 100% volumetric efficiency. They used to always say there's no replacement for displacement. I'm sure you've heard that, but that's not true anymore. And the reason that's not true is because of things like turbos and superchargers. Those things can force air into an engine and get them to operate at above 100% volumetric efficiency, which is really cool. So with our new ECU, we're gonna be able to tune our volumetric efficiency table. And from that, it figures out how much fuel to squirt and when and all that. So by tuning volumetric efficiency or speed density, it makes the tuning process a lot quicker and a lot easier. And it's pretty cool. Got it? I think my hands are clean enough for brain surgery. Let's dig in. So this is the uh, MS3 Pro plug and play setup from Megasquirt. We're gonna use the same connectors from our ECU. And they'll click right into the box here. So now that we're plugged in, I'm just gonna run our vacuum line from the engine bay back to the ECU. On the Miata, there's a hole down here that just had a plug in it. So I've got my welding wire and I just stabbed right into it, poked the welding wire through. Now it's also coming out the foot well and this will be our go-between. I'll use this to pull our vacuum line through. Okay, so we've got the vacuum line stuck onto the end of the welding wire and then we've got it taped on here. So now I'm gonna pull the welding wire through the firewall and hopefully bring the vacuum line with it. I'm gonna take this old plug that was in the firewall and the hole that we used, cut a little X in the middle of it and we're just gonna put our vacuum line through it just to protect it so that it doesn't get cut on the firewall. The Mega Squirt came with a supplied vacuum tee, so we're gonna tee in to this vacuum line right here that goes right into the intake manifold. So this vacuum line sees manifold pressure, whatever it is, at all times. So I have no concern about that coming out. You could add some little zip ties if you wanted to. Make sure it's not kinked. Make sure it, uh, you know, there's no resistance to flow anywhere so that our ECU gets a nice, accurate reading all the time. All right, now we've got the vacuum line through the firewall, so we're just working it back towards the ECU. We're uh, routing it under the carpet because we're trying to act like professionals. Ta-da! Now we can mount up our ECU box with some provided screws. Then we'll trim this to length, plug in our reference. We're also gonna install a wideband O2 sensor so we can monitor our air fuel ratios. You need a wideband. So we got one and we're gonna install it. We're gonna install our air fuel ratio gauge. Uh, I've got this one made by Innovate and it's a pretty sweet piece of kit. Uh, so we're gonna put it in the Miata so we can keep an eye on our air fuel ratios, which is very important when you're tuning, especially when you have a standalone ECU. I'm gonna install our gauge. I think I'm gonna use one of our air conditioning vents since I never use the air conditioning. And then we're gonna have to do a little bit of wiring. We're gonna replace our O2 sensor with this nice Bosch unit that the kit comes with, and this will allow us to keep an eye on our air fuel ratios. Oh, good Lord, on my toe. Jesus, I'm gonna break this thing someday. Okay, I guess the whole thing. Eddie, will you hand me that mother? That's not bad, that looks pretty good. 
maybe a, a little further recessed than I would like ideally, but that's not bad. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. So sad. We're gonna have to glue that. So our gauge wiring is wired. It's where it needs to be. Uh, let's get down there and get the old O2 sensor in place. Bam. All right, so we've got the cable that will go to our wideband controller. We'll run this across the engine, get it all so, and then we've got our new sensor that'll go down in the header and connect right here. And then it's just getting the controller wired up inside the car and getting the gauge working. So right now I'm looking for a 12 volt source that turns on with ignition on and a good ground. I'm checking this connector that goes to the window switches in uh, the center console. And what I'm looking for is a good ground and an ignition switched positive, an ignition switched 12 volts. So I've got my test leads here, one clamped to chassis to ground, and then I've got us on uh, continuity test right here. So we know if we touch the chassis anywhere, it'll create a continuous circuit and make a noise. Anything that makes that noise is ground. So in here, we've got ground. Now we need to find 12 volts. We'll go to our 20 volt range on our meter. And now we're just looking for 12 volts, but we want it to come on with the key. I don't want it to be on right now. And we're just looking for voltage to come up on the display on our multimeter and it's just staying zero right now. So none of these are hot currently. Cool. Let's turn the key on and see what we find. Well, bam. Okay, right beneath our ground, we've got 12 volts and it turns on with the key. So if I were to turn the key off right now, it's a switched source of power. And then we'll need to get the controller talking to the gauge with a wire that goes between the two. And I believe same deal with the ECU. Uh, one wire will go from the controller into the ECU. So we're gonna wire in a relay to control the wideband controller. We're also gonna fuse it with a little five amp fuse. Uh, so we're just adding a little circuit to power up the wideband controller. Should be nice and easy. I've got some spare relays. Uh, and it's just a matter of doing a little bit of wiring and soldering and putting things where they need to be. So if you need to run a big voltage from the battery, but you want it to be switched, and you don't really want to run that big voltage to a big giant switch, what you can do is switch big voltage with little voltage. So basically, I can run this straight from the battery, and then this straight into whatever I'm trying to power, but rather than having that constant on all the time from the battery, I switch it with the little side of the relay. So in this instance, what I'm going to do is run power straight from the battery, okay, into the relay, and then out of the relay and into the wideband controller. But I'm going to take 12 volt ignition source from the ECU and power up the small side of the relay so that we're not interfering with the ECU circuit. It's not pulling any extra voltage. All this needs to do is see 12 volts and it turns the switch on. So we can use that 12 volt ignition source that we found earlier, but we'll run power straight from the battery. So we're not drawing on the ECU circuit. Our standalone is in place and we've got all the wiring uh, roughed out for our OBD. Christ, I can't even remember what things we're doing. OBD2 sensor. All right, so we've got our new standalone ECU mounted, our uh, wideband O2 sensor controller. Now it's time to connect our laptop computer. Then we'll load up the base map that uh, Megasquirt provided us for a 1994 Miata, and then we should be able to get it to fire up, hopefully without too much drama. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> this is what's called Tuner Studio. This is the interface that we'll use between the Mega Squirt and our computer to do some tuning. But for right now, we gotta get this thing fired up. So this is the first time we've been in it. Let's create a new project. Money pet. Configuration settings, wideband. Uh, so now I need to figure out how to load up our base map uh, so that the ECU understands what car it's in. And then once we do that, it should be about time for startup. Figure it out, girl, figure it out. Well, it is running very rich, which is good. That's safe, you know. Uh, anything like this should default to running rich because rich 
while it is not efficient and you waste gas, it's safe. You're not generally gonna hurt your engine if you're running rich. Now I think this is probably just going through some checks and trying to figure out idle. I'm honestly not sure. I'm just gonna let it run for a while and we'll go from there. All right, so our idle has smoothed out. It's a little low right now, uh, but that's okay. We need to do a few things. I need to calibrate our throttle position sensor so the ECU knows what voltage closed throttle is and full open so it can figure out everything in between. And I also need to check the timing and make sure that the ignition timing actually matches the ECU and what's actually happening. I can lock the ignition timing at whatever I want, 10 degrees before top dead center. I'll lock it down, I'll get my timing light out, and I'll check to make sure that that's actually what's happening on the engine. And if it's not, I can go in and change through the ECU our spark timing to make sure that it's matched up. That's very important because if you think your spark timing is one thing and it's actually another, you can do a lot of damage. So you gotta check that anytime you install a new ECU. But I'm gonna do that tomorrow morning. Once again, we have made it down to Long Beach to my friends at EF1 Motorsports, or more specifically, their tuning division, EF1 Tuning. Uh, the Miata drove great on the way here, drives great on the base tune, it's very smooth. So I don't think we're gonna have to work too terribly hard to get this thing making power today. So let's go slam it on the dyno. Oh, critical pre-dyno checks. Make sure you have oil, make sure you have coolant, make sure the thing's running right. And I think we're all good here. You'd, you'd be surprised what, what people, people show up with. I Man. my car up, I was like, dude, you, there's no oil in there. Well, you know, you should have tuned some oil into it, Gibby. <laughs> I'm gonna blame you for anything that happens here today, good or bad, so <laughs> get ready for that. I am ready for it. So to make this pretty easy to understand, we were talking about volumetric efficiency before and how much easier it is to tune. Uh, and the reason it's easy is because you don't have to set a bunch of fuel corrections. Basically, you tweak your volumetric efficiency table until your actual air fuel ratio matches your target air fuel ratio. And that's when you know your volumetric efficiency table is correct. So once you do that, then it makes all the fuel calculations that you need and you're set to go. You just set your target air fuel ratio and the ECU hits it. It's pretty sweet. That's assuming the sensors and everything else is calibrated correctly? Yeah, it's assuming every, that it's a operating system that uh, is, you know, doesn't have any big flaws, but hopefully we don't have any big flaws. Okay, so we're connected. Hey. So this thing, to be safe, has idled and run pretty rich since I uh, installed the base map. So right now we're dialing some of the fuel out of the idle and we're gonna watch the uh, air fuel ratio come up closer to stoichiometric. I was running really fat at like 11 to one at idle, which is way too much. So we're dialing some of that out now and uh, we're underway, baby. The only thing we really can't effectively tune right now is cold start because the car is already warm. I drove it here. So uh, we'll be close on that, but we're doing a little bit of guesswork. So maybe we'll do some remote tuning later or, you know, you can just come over. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, first uh, steady state test, and we're gonna start at 1400 RPMs, work our way up, uh, you know, 2000 RPMs, 2500, so on and so forth, and develop ourselves a tune. So this is our ignition table, and all the numbers in these boxes is our specific ignition timing for any given load point. What I mean by that is a point, uh, an intersection of our RPMs, and basically our throttle position, or our load on the engine. So you can see down here, we've got our RPMs, 700, 900, 1200. Right now we're at idle, so we're at 900 RPMs in that box. You can see this blue oval moving. That's our tracer for what's actually happening right now. So we're at 900 RPMs and no load because he's off the throttle. Give me hit the gas a little. You'll see it climb as the throttle comes up and the RPMs go up, you see it move. So that's what we're looking at. It's a cross between the RPMs and the load. And then for each of those points, we can input our ignition timing in this table or our air to fuel ratio or our, our fuel VE. But these are the kinds of tables we'll look at. RPMs versus load. So that's the steady state tuning. We'll put it at 1500 and we'll tune all of these ignition timing points, all these load points. Then we'll crank it up to 2000, do that whole column, so on and so forth until we're done. Then we can do our big sweeps and really try to make some power. So this is this is the, the, the real, uh, what do you say? It. The meat of it, uh, the, the, yeah, this is the meat of it. It's meaty. A 
Okay, so we've basically worked our way through the rev range in those columns, adjusting timing and VE and fueling, and things are looking pretty good. So we're letting the car cool down for a minute, bring oil temps back down, coolant temps back down, then we'll fire it back up, and then it's gonna be time to do some sweeps, some real dyno pulls, and see how much power we're making, and then make some tweaks from there. But we're getting close. All right, so now we're gonna do what you would recognize as a regular dyno run. We're gonna run this thing wide open throttle from low RPM to red line and see how much power it makes. Now that we've got our map roughly figured out, even further than roughly, it's pretty well figured out. So now we can do a real run on the dyno, see how much power we make, and then make some tweaks based on what we see. Time to do it. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah, ah, yeah, baby. That is a smooth graph, which is exactly what you want. Smooth like a baby's bottom. And I don't know if you noticed, but we made 110 and a half horsepower. So that's pretty good. We're starting out above 108. I am happy. Ooh, is that 111? Ah, nice, baby. Nice. Break this thing for 112, Gibby. 64 is about where it is. <laughs> hey, that rounds up to 112. I mean, I'll take it. 111.6, shoot. All right, it all comes down to this. We're, we've let it cool down a little bit. We're gonna make another sweep, see how much power we make, and then however much power we make is how much power we make. Hopefully it's 112, but honestly, if not, I'm not too worried about it. Once we do that, then we've got a few little tweaks to make in terms of drivability, uh, and then that's it. Uh, we're done, off to the races. We'll go drive this thing, see how it feels in the real world. Thank you, sir. That was 112, 112.75, yeah! All right, well that's sweet. That's, I mean, that's all I could have ever hoped for. We're making power, we got control of the ECU. Now we gotta finish a few little tweaks and then that's it, baby. What a successful day. Honestly, the truth is, when it comes to tuning, making max power is not the hardest part of tuning. The hardest part, I think, is making it drivable and dealing with all the different load conditions and, and the transition between each load point on these maps. So we're gonna smooth things out. Actually, here's an idea. So we've got these maps, and this is how we tune them, but we want things to be smooth. So you can take a look at the 3D view and you can see whether or not it's smooth. And we can see we've got a few jumps here, a few areas that aren't that smooth. So we're gonna smoothen those out and that should help with drivability and overall feel of the tune. But we've made the power that we're gonna make. Now it's just time to smooth it over. Okay, so we've done our sweeps, we've made our power, we hit 112 horsepower. That's awesome. So now the last thing left to do, throw the wheels and tires back on it. We'll take it up and down the street, drive it around the block, make sure nothing weird happens in the real world since this is a little bit not real. And that's it. We're tuned, baby. We did it. All right, boys. See you guys. Thank you. Love you. Do a little circle right here. Not a donut. Just kind of on and off the throttle a little bit. Yeah, this thing feels great. Honestly, this thing feels uh, in a lot of ways like it did when it was stock, which is saying something, that's impressive. It's not that difficult to tune for max power, but I think it is pretty difficult to tune for drivability, and this thing's really drivable. So if you're in the SoCal area and you need a tune on your standalone, hit up my boy Gibby at EF1 Tuning. Uh, other than that, thank you guys so much for watching. Like always, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and make sure you got the notification bell rung so you know when we're putting out new videos. Follow me on Instagram at Zach Job and follow Donut at Donut Media. I'll see you guys next week.